last week, this guy Kelvin Kiptum. He won, he's from Kenya, and he won the men's London Marathon. He completed the 26.2 miles in the second fastest time in history. A time of two hours, one minute, and 23 seconds, which just sounds impossible to run 26 miles in. And this was only 16 seconds outside of the world record, set by a fellow Kenyan, a guy called Eliud Kipchoge, at the Berlin Marathon last year. Now, there's no doubt a genetic component to these men's ability to run that far, that fast. But that doesn't come easily to them. They have worked incredibly hard to get to that level. In order, to be a, <clears throat> in order to be a world record holder, every week, Kipchoge runs a variety of different runs. Long runs, shorter runs. Probably the shorter runs would quite be, quite be long runs for most of us. There would be hill runs, speed intervals, strength and conditioning, and core exercises. And all this mounts up to more than 200 kilometers of running every single week of his life. If you want to be an elite athlete, you have to be willing to accept a training program that is incredibly demanding and challenging and at times painful. But that's not just the case for the top sportsmen and women. It's also the case if we want to follow Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus effectively, we need to submit to God's training program. Last week, we were challenged by the writer of Hebrews that the life of faith is like running a race. And so if we're going to be all that God wants us to be, then we need to run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. The one who endured the cross to save us from our sin. But it's not easy to do that. There will be many times when we feel tempted to grow weary and give up. And so to help us to keep going in this race, to enable us to follow Jesus right to the end, God has put together a training program. And like those for elite athletes, it's not going to be easy. It's demanding, it's challenging, at times it can be painful. But if we submit to it, the results are going to be amazing. So this morning we're going to look at this better training program. And we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 to verse 11. And Lorraine is going to come and she's going to read for us. Thank you, Lorraine. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardships at hardship of discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children were not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a while, Um, as they thought best, for God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. (coughs) Thank you very much, Lorraine. I don't think many of us will be surprised to hear that the life of of faith in Jesus 
is a life of struggle. Some of us have more struggles than others, of course. But if we put our faith in Jesus, then the Bible guarantees us that we'll all face difficulties. Jesus himself promised this. He said in John chapter 16, verse 33, In this world you will have trouble. And part of this struggle is what the writer wrote in verse 4 of this reading. He said, your struggle against sin. Now there are a couple of ways of looking at what this is talking about. This might mean our personal struggle against our own sinful nature. The part of us that rebels against God and it just demands its own way. As we saw last week, if we are going to run this race with perseverance, we need to deal with that sin. We need to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. We need to live out the reality of the freedom from sin that Jesus died on the cross to win for us. But this struggle with, pers- with sin is also a struggle against persecution. This is what Jesus struggled with in his life. In the previous verse of this reading, the one that we looked at last week, we were encouraged to consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. Jesus was opposed. He was criticised. He was arrested, he was falsely accused, he was ridiculed, he was unjustly condemned, he was cruelly flogged, he was nailed to a cross and hung up to die in agony and shame. And as followers of Jesus, we are called in some way to follow in his footsteps. This is what Peter wrote. He said this in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. None of us will ever experience what Jesus suffered on the cross for us when he became sin for us, when he took the punishment that we deserved. But in this world, everyone who puts their trust in Jesus will experience persecution in some way. It's a promise of Scripture. As we've seen in this letter, the original readers of this letter, they certainly had experienced that. Sometimes, the writer says in Hebrews 10, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. That would have been difficult. That would have been painful. And when this letter was written, it seems that this persecution was stirring up again. So much so, that some of the original readers of this letter, they were thinking about giving up. They were thinking, enough's enough. This is too hard. We can't do this anymore. It's costing us too much. But the writer of Hebrews disagreed. Do you see what he says in verse 4? In your struggle against sin, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You've not gone the full way yet. You haven't yet given up your life for Christ. But of course, he gave up his life for us. He went to the cross for us. So could we ever say that the cost of following Jesus is too great when he paid such a price to save us? 
That beautiful hymn that I just love says this. Where the whole realm of nature mine. That were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine. Demands my soul, my life, and my all. So here is the challenging and yet wonderful reality. Whatever we're facing today, whatever struggles we're going through in our lives, whatever battle that we're enduring against our personal sin, or our experience of persecution, or anything else that we're going through, none of that is a valid reason to give up on Christ. Whatever it costs us, Jesus is worth it all. But if that's not enough for us, God has also promised that He is working for our good through all of that struggle. And through all of that suffering. So this, this letter wasn't written just so that we would endure hardship. Rather, the writer said in verse 7, Endure hardship as discipline. Now what does that mean? What does it mean to endure hardship as discipline? Well, this word for discipline here, It's the same as what Paul used when he wrote in Ephesians chapter 6. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. My kids are always reminding me of that one. Uh, Instead, bring them up in the training or the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the training and instruction, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Of the Lord. So discipline is how a parent trains their child. How the parent speaks into their lives. Challenges their wrong behaviour or wrong attitudes or wrong thoughts. And shapes them into the man or woman that they want them to be. It's parental discipline, parental training. And that's what God is doing in our lives through the struggles and through the suffering. It's, this suffering is not empty. It's not meaningless. Instead, through it, He is disciplining us. He is sanctifying us. He is shaping us into the men and women that God wants us to be. Of course, through our faith in Jesus, we have already been made holy. We've already been set apart from this world to belong to God, to live with Him, to live for Him, and to live like Him. We've seen this already in this letter, that those who have trusted in Jesus, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. If you you and I have trusted in Jesus, then we are holy this morning. We are a saint this morning. Not through what we've done, but through what Jesus has done on the cross for us. And one day, that will be fully realized, that will be fully seen in our lives. One day, we will just be like Jesus. We will be completely transformed to be like Him, to be as perfect as He is. That day when we get to be with Him in heaven, and we see Him as He is, and we will be like Him. But none of us are living completely holy lives now. The Bible is clear. All of us struggle with sin now. And so God is working in our lives by His Holy Spirit to increasingly make us holy. To increasingly sanctify us. To progressively transform us so that we are more and more live out who we already are 
in Christ. We're not trying to become somebody. We're not trying to become something. We're just trying to step into more and more of who Jesus has already made us to be. So we are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. God is working in our lives to change us, to make us more like Jesus. And one day he will finalize, he will finish that work. In heaven. And God uses many different means in that process of sanctification, in that process of making us more like Jesus. One of those, of course, is the Bible. Crucial one. This is what Paul says about the Bible. All scripture, <coughs> excuse me, is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and, there's this word discipline again, training in righteousness. The Bible is useful for this training process, this sanctifying process. It's why we need to keep on reading God's Word and letting it sink in and soak into our hearts. But God also uses prayer or worship like we've done this morning, our times of communion together, our fellowship and service, all of these things to help us to change. But he also uses our suffering. He also uses our difficulties. He also uses our struggles. Look at verse 10. God disciplines us for our good. That we may share in his holiness. Through the difficult times in our lives, God is working in us to teach us, to shape us, to set us apart, to live for him. Through suffering, he teaches us to learn, to see through the deception of evil. To turn away from our selfishness. To seek his presence. To depend on his help. To believe in his goodness. To value his purpose. To wait for his timing. To trust in him. So if we have trusted in Jesus. If we are a follower of Jesus this morning. The encouragement is that our suffering and, and, and times of struggle in our lives, they are not empty and they're not meaningless. They're not a waste. They're not pointless. No matter how painful they are, God won't waste them. Instead, he redeems them. He turns them up on their head and he uses them for our good. He works through them. I'm sure many of us know this wonderful verse, Romans 8, verse 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God is working for our good, especially in those difficult times. This is what C.S. Lewis famously said. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasure. He speaks in our conscience. But he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And so, yes, this, these times of discipline, they are painful, but they're also productive. They're also worthwhile. As verse 11 says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. But painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And that is why God's discipline in our lives, or God's training in our lives, is an expression of His love. Now, often we can be tempted to think. Now, when we go through hardships, when life gets tough, 
It shows that somehow God doesn't love us anymore. And that's understandable. Because in this world, sometimes training and discipline is unloving. A couple of weeks ago, a university in Kentucky agreed to pay $14 million to the family of a student who died during training. I think he was a wrestler or something like that in, in, this, in the university. And he, he was forced to sprint up and down this steep hill a number of times. And he was absolutely exhausted, so he begged for water. But the coaches refused. And as a result, he died of heat stroke. The coach's actions, whatever their motivation was, they were certainly not loving. In Ireland, we are also all too aware of those who abuse their power to hand out what they call discipline, was, but was certainly not loving discipline. I don't know if you heard in the, in, in the radio, but I heard a couple of weeks ago uh, an interview about a movie that was coming out in Ireland which looks at the violent punishment of kids in schools a number of years ago. And those who who stood up and opposed them uh, focused in the the town of Navin. And one of the shocking incidents that was was mentioned on the news was when a a mum came into a doctor's surgery with her nine-year-old son, Norman. Norman had broken his right arm in a fall. And his mum was there to to see if the doctor would write a little note, a letter, to Norman's teacher. To ask the teacher to stop beating him on his broken arm. And instead, beat him on the other arm instead. And incredibly, the reason why Norman was getting beaten up wasn't because he was a terrible kid. But it was because he was writing with his left hand. And left-handedness was not acceptable. It's a sign of the devil or something like that. So we know that in this country, discipline, what was called discipline, was often far from loving. And I know that some in our church have also suffered through the cruelty of others in a variety of situations. Even from parents, which they might have called discipline. So discipline in this world is not always loving. So we understand that people kind of react against this if they recoil from this idea. But we don't need to worry about this when it comes to God. We don't need to worry that God's discipline is not loving or is cruel or is harsh. If we do worry that, then we're doing what the original readers of this letter were doing. Verse verse 5. You have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. There are still lots of unanswered questions when it comes to suffering. I'm certainly not claiming that I have all the answers. I certainly don't. I'm sure you still have lots of questions. But there are lots of things in the Bible that can encourage us while we're going through them. And this is one of them. Proverbs 3, he quotes from, in verse 6, The Lord disciplines those He loves. The Bible declares that God's discipline, God's training of us, is not a sign of the absence of His love, but actually a demonstration of that love. He is working these all these things all together for our good, Because he loves us. Because he values us. Because he delights over us. But even more than that, it's also because we belong to him. Look at verse 6. He punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Now we struggle with that word punish. Okay? Because it sounds like for us, that means God's condemning us for our sin. But as we've seen in this letter, that can't be the case. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. By one sacrifice, he's made us perfect. 
So if we've trusted in Jesus, then all of our sins have been forgiven, our guilt has been removed, and our sin debt has been paid in full. So we'll never experience the punishment that we deserve. We'll never be excluded from God's presence. We'll never be banished from His love. There is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Instead, we are eternally His children. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. But as His children, we will experience His parental discipline. The training and the direction that all parents need to give to their kids, God will work in our lives. For what son is not disciplined by his father? I think the crucial word here is, a son is disciplined by his father. If we are a parent then we are selective in who we discipline. We better be. Because like, if kids are messing out in the street, most of us would not go out to them and tell them off. To do that would be to get ourselves into all sorts of problems. But if our kids are the ones who are messing in the street, if they are misbehaving, if they are fighting with each other, or if they're doing something wrong, then it is our responsibility to go and deal with that. Our discipline of our kids is a sign that they are ours. And in the same way, God's discipline is a sign that we belong to Him. When He disciplines us, God is treating us as sons. I know this doesn't come naturally to us when we're going through these difficult times. That's not how we naturally think when, when things feel as if they're falling apart. We don't feel, we, we can't see that God is at work in those situations. But we need to tell ourselves that when we go through those difficult times, when we're experiencing hardship or opposition, This is not a sign that God is far from us. Rather, according to this passage, it's evidence that we belong to God. That we are His children. And if we can accept that, then we will be able to submit to God's discipline. And we will be able to be trained by it. Look at verse 9. Excuse me. We've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. Many of us had good parents. Not all of us, I know, but many of us did. They weren't perfect. They didn't get everything right. But they lovingly disciplined us when we needed it. And they did it as best as they could. And of course, some of us needed it more than others, speaking from personal experience. But our Heavenly Father is perfect in His knowledge. He is perfect in His love. He is perfect in His wisdom. He is perfect in His patience. And so, how much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? If we submitted to our parents' discipline, because we realise that, yeah, not nice, but but they're there, they're trying to do their best for us, then how much more should we be willing to submit to our Heavenly Father's training programme? How much more should we be willing to go through it, believing that God knows what He is doing, that He loves us completely, and that through it all, He is working for our good. And so the quotation from Proverbs 3 starts with, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't be indifferent to those difficult times. 
Don't treat them as something insignificant or meaningless or pointless or a waste of time. Don't miss, overlook, ignore what God is doing through them. God's at work. But neither should we lose heart when he rebukes you. When tough times come, it's easy for us to feel disappointed, discouraged, even defeated by them. But we don't need to. Because this is not a disaster. God is at work. And he's at work for our good. Don't make light of it. Don't be overwhelmed by it. And don't give up on it. Endure hardship as discipline. Keep on going. Persevere. No matter how hard it gets. Not because those times are easy or pleasant. But rather because even in the most difficult times, even in our toughest struggles, we recognize that God is still in control. That this is all part of his better training program. And that through them he is sanctifying us. He is working for our eternal good. Making us more and more like Jesus. And that he's doing this in love. Because we belong to him as sons. And so we can submit to him. In faith. Believing that he is faithful to all of his promises. And at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. Of righteousness and peace. So once again in this passage, we're asked to look beyond what we can see. And to put our faith in God. And follow in the footsteps of Jesus. The one who endured the cross. For the joy set before him. Scorning its shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God.